Welcome everyone to the Spine Nevada Virtual Health Seminar on the Prevention and Treatment of Basketball Injuries. This is Molly Canada, Director of Integrated Marketing for Spine Nevada. We are excited to have all of you join us this evening. During tonight's virtual event, you'll hear from Dr. Michael Rozak on the following topics. He'll talk about basketball injury statistics, common basketball injuries that occur. He'll talk about how to prevent basketball injuries and conservative treatment options. And he'll also talk about advanced treatment options for basketball and sports related injuries. We'll have time at the end of Dr. Rozak's presentation for question and answer. So please submit your questions through the Q&A box. Without further delay, I'll now turn the meeting over to Dr. Michael Rozak. Thank you, Dr. Rozak. Hey, good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Mike Rozak, one of the new physicians here at Spine Nevada. Just moved here from Georgia in August of 2021 with my family. I uh, did most of my training in the Maryland area and then in Atlanta at Emory. Did a pain fellowship over there. And my main training is in physiatry or physical medicine and rehab. But I have exposure in sports medicine and pain medicine and personal uh, exposure in, in sports injuries as well. So I'll be giving a talk tonight on common basketball injuries, treatment and prevention options. So the objectives for this talk will be basketball injury stats, common basketball injuries we see, common basketball injury prevention and conservative treatment options, and then more advanced treatment options that we offer. So what sport has the most injuries? Football, basketball, wrestling, soccer, hockey, skiing. Well, it's what this talk is about. And they've seen that in patients 15 and older, uh, about 1.5 athletes per 1,000 have a basketball related injury. So most injuries are actually from basketball. If you were to look at hours uh, played of a sport, football then would out, out, outweigh basketball and have slightly more injuries. But if you're just playing a sport, basketball tends to have the most injuries. And we've seen a lot of these injuries, Kobe Bryant, Gordon Hayward, Zion Williamson, Clay Thompson, uh, Derek Rose, and Kevin Durant. So, you know, there, there's a saying here by Jim Rohn, take care of your body, it's the only place you have to live. So moving to Reno from the East Coast, uh, I know this is a ski town, so I thought I'd show you guys the first time I ever tried skiing, and this was uh, back on the East. So uh, I, I wanted to do a bunch of jumps, and even though they're very small jumps, I could not land a single jump. And as you can tell here, I didn't treat my body too well. And by the grace of God, I didn't injure anything somehow, but just know that this is a, the place you have to live. And this is why we are giving this talk today to, to, to tell you about the common injuries of basketball and hopefully ways you can prevent these. So some background about basketball injuries There's about 25 million people in the United States that play basketball. If you think about this at the high school level, there's about 18,000 schools with 1 million high school student athletes, that's males, females, JV, and varsity. In the United States, there's about 1.6 million basketball injuries that occur yearly or annually. Most of these tend to be the lower extremity, but they can also be head injuries as well. In the pediatric or youth population, kids, uh, we see a higher prevalence of uh, injuries happening, not in games, but more so for pickup basketball or, or, or not during organized play. And the most common injury for kids are usually of their hands, their head region, and, and cuts and bruises. So more background about some basketball injuries. When someone's injured, where do they go? Most of the time, if they're gonna be seen, they're gonna be seen in the emergency department or primary care office for all sports injuries. So over a 10 year span, they looked at the emergency department and they saw that they saw about 4 million children and adolescents in the emergency department for sports alone. Now for basketball, that's around 170,000 patients seen uh, annually, and 12.5 of them were basketball related within the ED. Um, the most common injury they saw were sprains and strains of the lower extremities, and then after that it was uh, finger and hand issues, usually jammed fingers. So sprains and strains are different, so I just wanna hit on that point really quickly with this image on the top right. So you have bones, ligaments, muscles, tendons. So a ligament attaches a bone to a bone right here, and that's called a sprain if you injure that. And then tendons are muscles that attach to bone via a tendon. 
So tendon has T in it and strain has T in it. So that's how you can remember strains or sprains. And within our um, Spine Nevada network, we have an urgent care clinic called SWIFT, which is where we have um, assistants trained in MSK or sports medicine and, and, and orthopedics, along with fellowship trained sports medicine doctors that see musculoskeletal injuries or injuries of the, of the bones, the muscles and the joints. And the good thing about this is that's what they specialize in. And you're way less likely to be exposed to COVID-19 here as you would be potentially in the emergency department right now or the primary care office. So this is what the building looks like in the Reno office in the top left, but there's two, one in Reno and one in Sparks. And you can see the hours here, usually um, 12 hour shifts, but the Swift one is actually open during the weekend as well on Saturdays. So if you have a sports related injury, uh, these people are very well trained and versed to see it in the acute setting. So I, I'm not sure what my audience is out there. So I was gonna to touch on a couple of different things with injuries based on age and gender and, and then other common injuries. So talking about injuries based on age, we'll start with the youth population this is around kids age five to 10. And all you really have to do is look at the picture on the right. You see two kids having fun. They're pretty close to each other. It looks like their heads might even knock each other there. And the, the kid on the, on, the, on the right, who I think is dribbling the ball, his left hand, the fingers are downwards. So the most common injuries we see in, adult, in, in youth population, sorry, is finger injuries, usually from jamming the ball against their fingers or head injuries from, from knocking heads together. So um, head injuries, uh, we, we call those traumatic brain injuries. If you have any blood on a CAT scan or MRI, it is automatic a moderate or severe traumatic brain injury. If there's no blood seen, but you have cognitive issues, we call that a concussion. So we see, once again, in the youth population, a higher prevalence of these injuries during non-organized play, when kids are just out having fun on the pickup courts. Then for everybody else, you know, high schoolers, NCA, and professional, now most of the injuries are going to be in the lower extremity. High schoolers actually account for most of the massive injuries we see. They're three times more likely to sustain a lower body injury than the youth population is. And now for adolescents, NCAAs, and the pros, all of the injuries tend to happen or sorry, more of the injuries tend to happen during, during the game time than practice, almost twofold. And what was interesting in, in, in one study, um, high school athletes, uh, majority of the time are getting injured in the second half of games. You can see in the NCA, 60% of all injuries are in the lower extremity and in the professional level, NBA, and in the WNBA, that ticks up another 5% to about 65% of all injuries. So this image kind of um, hits at that point. Way more explosive, people jumping super high, landing on people's feet, you know, a lot more force going into uh, this level of basketball than kind of the youth kids who are, who are having a bunch of fun up there. And when we look at injuries based on age and gender, well, for the youth population, they're pretty equal uh, between males and females or boys and girls. But as we start to get to high school, now females tend to have more knee injuries and more injuries slightly overall than males, 2.08 versus 1.83. Males tend to have more fractures and kind of thigh contusions in high school. As we get to the college level, males tend to get injured more and their uh, main uh, injury is the same as, as females, which is lateral ankle sprains. The data on that shows about one in four injuries is uh, co commonly a lateral ankle sprain for both males and females. But then the big difference is internal knee injuries. You can think of this as an ACL. Females are twice as likely in this one study uh, to have a uh, ACL injury uh, than their male counterparts. And one uh, interesting study looked at um, times that ACLs uh, uh, tend to occur in female athletes in college. And they noticed that there was in particularly uh, times of increased, increased training loads. So this was usually within the first two weeks of play or even after the holidays, they started to see increased injuries. And another study quoted slightly higher for ACL or anterior cruciate ligament injuries in, in female uh, athletes for basketball was about three to four times more likely. Either way, way more likely than their male counterparts. And in the professional level, um, pretty similar in the injury rate uh, the female athletes in the WNBA slightly higher injuries, but lateral ankle sprains in those are also the most common. So understanding common types of injuries associated with basketball can help prevent these injuries potentially. And if you do a quick search on Google, basketball injuries, I just want this take home point to be 
most of them are in the lower extremity, right? And that's kind of common what we see uh, once you get to the adolescent high school age and, and beyond. So our first uh, injury we talk about is within the foot and ankle, lateral ankle sprains. This is the most common injury seen. So lateral means the, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but I'm pointing to the outside of the foot here. So lateral means outside and it's a sprain. So that's bone to bone and it's a ligament. And this usually happens what we call an inversion injury or your foot, the sole of your foot is going inwards. Eversion would be going in the opposite direction. So typically this is an injury to the ligaments there. You have two main ligaments here and they are named based on the bones that they attach to and where they are. So anterior is in the front, talo is the bone and fibular is the bone over here and that's the ligament. Then you have the calcaneo, which is the calcaneus here and also the fibular ligament and the fibular bone here. So it attaches two bones to two bones. And with tendons and ligaments, there's a grading scheme. So sometimes you'll hear it on ESPN that so-and-so had a grade one lesion, a grade two sprain, et cetera. What that means is that uh, just how much tearing they see. So to keep it easy, a grade three is a complete tear. A grade one is a little bit, maybe a third, and then a grade two is somewhere in the middle. So with a lateral ankle sprain, a lot of times you're gonna see swelling, bruising, maybe some pain at the site. Typically we're gonna use a PRICE method, uh, the acronym PRICE for protection, rest, ice, compression, and elevation for these. In some instances though, further, further care is needed and um, evaluation by a, a trained physician or physician assistant. And that may require x-rays, MRI, or ultrasound to kind of dig deeper and see the extent of the injury. You know, number one, making sure there's no fracture. And number two, seeing the extent of the ligament injury there. So there's been a lot of studies and data on potentially preventing ankle sprains. And the first two images on the top right are is an ankle brace on the left versus taping on the right. So it's a little bit controversial. Um, and when you talk about preventing uh, lateral ankle sprains, you talk about primary prevention, which means you've never had an ankle sprain and you are trying to prevent one from ever happening, and secondary prevention, which is where you've had an ankle sprain, but you're trying to prevent a re-sprain. So data is actually stronger if you've had an ankle sprain, and now you're going to use some form of bracing or taping to prevent a secondary sprain from happening. They still advise, or we still advise, that you should use um, bracing to mi minimize the risk of lateral ankle sprains, but it's not clear cut. And between the two of them, ankle bracing is preferred, whereas with ankle taping, that's something you have to do every practice, every game. And as you are playing throughout the day, the elasticity of that increases or the strength of the taping decreases. So it's gonna be looser. Whereas an ankle brace, um, you can always uh, make that tighter throughout the game. Then the next thing is shoes, high top versus low top. So most people think basketball and, and they think high top. So where did this kind of come from? Well, back in the 19th century, most males were wearing boots and high top boots and shoes essentially. So they just transitioned what the look was back then to a basketball shoe. And conventional wisdom would say, well, it looks like the high top or what's called a high collar is covering more of that ankle where that ligament and, and ankle may roll. So that should work better. It wasn't until Kobe Bryant came out with a shoe in the, in the 2000s that was a low cut that had everyone asking this question, you know, which one should we wear? Is there a difference? So there is no difference in rate of lateral ankle sprains if you wear a low top versus a high top shoe. The um, reason is, is that the forces at play to create an ankle sprain are greater than the, the strength that you have from wearing a high top shoe. So it makes no difference. Actually, what they saw is when you wear a low top shoe, your ankle dorsiflexion, or when you take your toes towards your knee or, or flex your foot upwards, increases by about five degrees and makes you more agile and have a higher likelihood to cut and make certain cuts and, and movements while you're playing. So they noticed uh, that as one uh, positive reason to potentially wear low cuts. But if you look at the NBA now, stats are about 50-50, or players where half the players wear low cuts and half the players wear high tops. Next common injury is a stress fracture. This is an overuse injury, uh, usually from rapid increase in activity and repetitive trauma. Most people think of this as 
shin splints, uh, which occur in the tibia or the lower leg bone, but it can occur in other common places within the, within the foot and ankle. Most commonly the navicular bone, fifth metatarsal, and the medial malleolus, which is the inside bone of the foot. The image on the top right is an MRI depicting the navicular bone, and you see the whiteness there. That's showing us that there's an injury and some edema to that area. So what causes this? A lot of times it's rapid increase in a physical activity, usually from fatigue muscles, not being able to absorb the shock that they're used to, and then they transfer this injury, or they transfer this force, sorry, to, to the bone and then create a tiny fracture. A lot of times we'll see this in other sports. So tennis, for example, if you go from playing on a clay court to a hard court or having a different equipment or having different shoes, it will change the way that forces are, are transmitted throughout your lower leg. But the main one is a rapid increase in physical activity. Usually you can diagnose this with exam, but sometimes we need imaging to see it as well. Actually, there was a study uh, in family medicine where they said 78% uh, of the diagnosis can be made from history and physical alone. Uh, treatment options for this uh, is rest from the activity that's causing the stress. Sometimes we'll put people in a boot or a brace, and sometimes you even have them on crutches so their, their foot or their lower leg is not um, touching the ground at all and creating any more uh, increased force. So a prevention, there's a soft rule that you should try to increase activity weekly by about 5% and then try to wear proper equipment. Other common injuries in the foot are blisters. And these are pretty tough to treat and they're painful. <laughs> so this is occurring from a shearing force within, the, within two layers of your skin. You have many layers of your skin, but one of the layers will lift open and then fill with lymphatic fluid. So that's why you see usually kind of a clear fluid look to it. Uh, they can become infected, infected, sorry. Some people are, are more prone to them just the way that they uh, create shear and put pressure on their feet or on other parts of their foot. A lot of times we'll drain these and that reduces uh, pain and improves patient's function and it decreases risk for infection a lot of times. So there's many different products out there. Uh, we're not trying to promote one or the other, but either way you have to, if you have a blister, you have to take the pressure off of it. So making sure you're wearing shoes that fit, form-fitting shoes. You can imagine if your foot is in a shoe that's a couple sizes too big, now your foot's gonna slide or create a shear force within that shoe. You can also tape your feet if you're starting to get a blister because now that's decreasing the friction that's causing there. Or you can have um, one of these ones from CVS or Walgreens where they create a cutout for the blister itself so there's no pressure going on there. And sometimes uh, having insoles that, that change the forces within the, within the foot uh, also help as well. So moving up to the knee, the uh, most common injury that we see and the most severe one is uh, the ACL tear. And that stands, the ACL stands for anterior or in the front, cruciate ligament. So if you look at the image in, at, at the right over here, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but where there is a little red tear here, this is the ACL. And uh, the ligament behind it is the PCL. So th this makes a cross with each other. And that's why they call it cruciate. And so anterior is just the one in the front and then posterior is the one in the back. These injuries usually uh, occur non-contact, meaning there was no um, other force to the knee besides the person creating it themselves. This is usually from a quick cutting motion, as you can see on the right side of the picture here, where if, you, if your leg bone is going one way and your lower leg bone is going the other, it's gonna create this shearing force. And this is kind of a basketball move here. Imagine if you had the ball in the right hand and shifting it to the left hand, this is the kind of motion that your knee is making and creating what we call a valgus stress on the knee. Valgus, if you look at the, the hip here, in relation to the knee, the knee is going inwards, and that's what we call valgus. If it was going outwards, we would call it varus. So a valgus, or inwards force towards the knee, um, towards the center of the body, creates more stress on that ACL ligament. So we have to try to identify uh, athletes that can be at risk. Now, biologically, females uh, tend to have wider pelvises than males, so they're more likely to have a valgus knee or what we call a Q angle. So Q angle is when you measure the uh, quadriceps from where it starts at the top to where it goes down to the knee and you measure this angle. So in this picture depicted, a, woman, a woman's Q angle is 18 and a man's is 13. So a, a, a degree difference of about five degrees. One way to see this when we're actually playing or doing activity is to do a single leg squat. 
So this uh, leg here, as you can see, is going the hip, the knee, and the foot are all pretty much in line. So they're all centered over each other. So there's less st stress on the ACL in, in this position. Whereas in this one, you can see the knee collapsing inwards or having a valgus stress on that knee. And uh, they just drew their degrees this way instead of coming from the inside. But you can appreciate how this knee is going more inwards. So there's other ways to test this. Uh, a landing error scoring system is one where you have athletes do a bunch of jumps and different plyometric maneuvers and you kind of see how valgus their knee becomes. The, the gold standard for assessing an uh, athlete's uh, wrist though is something called 3D motion analysis, but that's kind of a different talk. Uh, so how can you potentially prevent this? There's a training called neuromuscular training, or really what you're trying to do is you're trying to take this Q angle and make it less, or you're trying to get the hip, the knee and the foot over top of each other. So they uh, did one study where they saw, okay, if we implement muscle training or you know, strength training to correct this, how effective will that be to decrease ACL uh, tears or ruptures? So they saw they had to treat about 89 people, which is the number needed to treat, to prevent one ACL injury. So if you think about a football team, roughly 90, you know, 50, 60, 90 people, depending on the team, if they all did a neuromuscular training, then you would decrease about one ACL tear. And the relative risk reduction doing a neuromuscular training is about 70%. In females in, in particular, they saw about a 17%, 17, 18% reduction rate doing neuromuscular training. Uh, this doesn't have to be super long. One uh, program that's kind of nice and easy to try is the FIFA 11. Uh, that is 20 minutes, two times a week. So you can do it as a warm up, you know, before sports, you can do it as a warm up after, you know, trying to integrate something though that'll help align the hip, the knee, and the foot. I had one uh, colleague that I trained with who was um, afraid of having his knee have an increased Q angle. So every morning he would do single leg squats while he brushed his teeth and side lunges uh, the evening when he would brush his teeth. So he got squats in the morning and squats at night. Side lunges are gonna help improve muscular strength of, the, of a muscle on the outside here that pulls the knee kind of back into alignment on the outside. And one, uh, and one other thing, so ACL injuries are common, surgeries are common as well. Uh, we try to prevent them. You know, if you have surgery, you're actually eight times more likely later in life to require a total knee arthroplasty or, or a total knee surgery. Other common injuries within the knee is the meniscus. The meniscus is a C-shaped cushion uh, that sits between the two bones and it really absorbs shock. So this uh, tends to tear a lot in basketball when we're making a cutting motion. Um, you may have, if, if this happens, you may feel a clicking in your knee when you're moving it, it may swell. You can diagnose this on exam, but a lot of times you're gonna need an MRI. Recovery rates from um, the meniscus uh, injury is, is quite good. At, at the NBA level, they saw about 80% of people return to the same level of play. Usually we try to preserve, the, pr preserve this as much as we can. So if you have a tear, we'll try to suture it, we'll try to inject it. We'll try to do conservative care that we keep the meniscus there. Uh, previously, uh, back in the 90s, a lot of people were taking the meniscus out, which decreased pain right at the time, but years later, um, arthritis would set in faster than if you left it in. Other common injuries, now this is outside the knee, the patellar tendon. So you have your quadriceps, quadriceps muscle or the muscles in your thigh that extend your knee. Uh, this translates through the patella or the kneecap and then you have the patella to the, to the tibia here, and you have the patellar tendon in between there. So this injury is usually coming once, once kids are starting to jump and run a lot more. So you can imagine the force that you're creating to jump, all of that is kind of translating through here, through the patellar tendon into the uh, bottom of the leg. So when kids' bones are still growing and adapting, if you have a lot of force from where this patellar tendon inserts, if you can see on this X-ray down here, onto the bone, the bone will actually start to pull off um, of itself. And this is called, the eponym for this is called osgood schlatter syndrome or disease. Uh, I actually have this as well. Um, and this is a uh, lifelong deformity, but pain tends to uh, resolve once, these bone, once the bone closes. A lot of times treatment for this uh, is going to be rest to the area, maybe not doing as many jumps, 
Uh, sometimes people wear this band here across the patellar tendon. If you, if you can imagine putting a band across this, now all of that force is gonna uh, transmit there and it's gonna relieve some of the pressure going down to the bone. Treatment for this, we do eccentric exercises, or if you imagine if you're doing a bicep curl, so you curl it upwards, when you're letting it back down or your muscle is uh, lengthening, we call that eccentric. So we do a lot of um, kind of going into a squat uh, sits for these to kind of improve the patellar tendon. Um, sometimes though people need injections or surgeries to calm this down as well. Other ones in the, in the, in the leg are thigh contusions. Uh, most common location for this uh, is the thigh. Um, things here aren't getting regenerated, they're just getting repaired. It's usually you're gonna have blood products that kind of sit within the muscle. Uh, main thing here we wanna make sure is you don't get something called compartment syndrome where the blood keeps going within the muscles and uh, causes ischemia or decreased blood flow. Usually we treat this trying to move the leg, move the blood around, decrease the blood that's in there, massages, ice, range of motion, maybe a short course of an NSAID, something like ibuprofen, uh, Aleve. And there are some um, people that recommend wearing thigh contusion guards to, to decrease this from happening. Sometimes this injury can take four to six weeks to heal, to heal if, it's, if it's pretty severe. Um, I don't know the date off the top of my head for a thigh contusion guard prevention though. Other common injuries we see are jammed fingers. You know, this is one of the more common injuries. A lot of times you can uh, just at home or the athletic trainer can tape the finger that's injured with the finger next to it um, to stabilize it and you can return to the game. If the finger dislocates or pops out and then you re-pop it back in, we recommend getting an x-ray there because there are instances where you can fracture the, uh, the, the bone in between that while you're resetting it. So you just wanna make sure that doesn't happen. Sometimes when you have a jammed finger, you can have a ligament injury as well something called a mallet finger or jersey finger. Sometimes those require surgery. So if you have a, a jam finger that's not getting better, if you have a jam finger that dislocated, um, or if you have a kind of a, a hanging deformity from the finger, you probably want to get evaluated for this. Other common injuries more to the head and neck region, facial cuts, uh, eye injuries, nasal fractures. A lot of times these can be managed uh, kind of at the sidelines. Sometimes if you have a uh, a laceration, you may require a suture there. Um, eye injuries, you know, pretty common. Uh, they noticed in female athletes, the shorter the nails are, the less likely eye injuries are to, to occur, which is, uh, which makes sense. Uh, and then on to the last part of the talk, advanced treatment options um, for these type of injuries. This is something called interventional orthopedics. Um, so within injections, uh, this is kind of the 1% or even less than 1% of people that do injections that perform these. And these are pretty much orthobiologic type of injections, meaning we take products from your own body and we inject them back into you to promote healing or faster healing of certain areas. It's really good for joints, ligaments, tendons, bursa. There's even good data putting it into bones for certain regions. Um, so may, you may have heard some of these terms before, PRP or platelet-rich plasma, bone marrow aspirate concentrate or, or BMAC. Another one is uh, taking it from the fat or uh, one of the, the trade names is lipogens. And this could be a whole talk on its own, but the, the takeaway from this is we, we try to take cells from your own body or, or stimulating factors from your own body to promote healing or rapid kind of healing. So this would be a setup for PRP. We draw your blood. We spin it down, we get the layer of just the PRP itself, which is platelet-rich plasma, and then we inject it into the area. There's a whole treatment protocol for this, and if you want other lectures on this, we can give you that as well. And then um, mesenchymal cells, or what, uh, for quote, stem cells, uh, really these are, are, are cells that are promoting all of these positive things to happen to increase uh, growth to these tissues or healing to these tissues. Also very scientific. <laughs> uh, some common basketball players, you know, going back to basketball here, who have used PRP. Uh, Kobe Bryant is one. Derrick Rose, another. Darren Williams, uh, a long list of players. So the NBA actually came out with, uh, in 2002, the orthobiologics consensus statement, or what they say they are allowing people to do based on the data. So within this, they said, 
you know, this has strong potential, these orthobiologic products. It's, it's pretty in, enthusiastic among us, among physicians, among patients, essentially. And they say that they have noticed that it does uh, heal cartilage, muscle, tendons, ligaments, meniscus. And currently right now, based on the 2020 NBA orthobiologics consensus statement, they support it for knee arthritis and patellar tendinopathy issues. They also noted that for ankle sprains, players will return to play sooner or faster. For the other injuries, as of right now, they have not uh, recommended it, but they say they're continuing to look at the data. So these injections are a little bit more intricate than others. And for instance, this is an, an ACL or anterior cruciate ligament. As you recall, it kind of makes a cross within the knee. So we use x-ray or fluoroscopy. Sometimes we use ultrasound to guide a needle into this ligament and then inject it with whatever product uh, we think may help it uh, regrow. This is a MRI of the ACL, looking at it from the side. So this is a pre-MRI. I think you can see my mouse, but I'm pointing to the one with the circle and the red arrow here. So this is a tear within the ACL. This is a post-op MRI uh, about a year, uh, about six months later, sorry, where they look at the ACL starting to see it regrow. And then this is further out, a year out, where they saw a complete regrowth of the ACL. Um, I had a colleague in Atlanta who does predominantly this for the whole kind of uh, Southeast region. And he has actually healed uh, complete ACL tears. Uh, with using uh, bone marrow treatment into the ACL as well. Just depends on kind of where the fibers look on the MRI. Uh, next one on the left is in the meniscus here. So this is into the medial meniscus on this image here. And uh, this is on the right side, this is an ankle joint injection. And when you see kind of the, the black stuff, that's contrast dye that we're putting into that area to confirm that we're there. And then we inject the injecting. And on the right side, this is an, an ankle joint going within the ankle joint there. That would be for arthritis. Next one that we tend to use is for patellar tendon issues, so tendinopathy of the tendon. Uh, on the right, on the image of the right here, this is actually an ultrasound. It's looking at the tendon from what we call a cross-sectional angle or from up to down. And you can see this black kind of defect. Uh, this is the tendon here circling around it. And then this is a black defect within the tendon or tendinopathy. So all the fibers there aren't really aligning. Can be a, a source of pain. So this is after the injection. Um, I think this one was six months later. And you can see that this uh, has now regrown and kind of healed within the tendon itself. The image on the left here, this is also the patellar tendon. The uh, white here on the MRI is showing us injury. When we actually ultrasound people in the clinic, we can turn on what we call color Doppler and it'll show us this increase signal, meaning there's a lot of new blood vessels that are there that are trying to bring healing factors to the tendon to heal it. Uh, when we do this injection, we, we use ultrasound. Everything is done sterile. Uh, this one's kind of tough to see, but here's the patellar bone. There is the tendon and there is the needle with the PRP going into it. PRP is a pretty good one to use for, for this uh, patellar tendon area. Uh, another study, uh, I was actually a part of this one. It was pretty neat. Uh, I think this was a tri-continental study <laughs> where we looked at elderly patients with uh, chronic knee arthritis. We took fat from their, mostly from their abdomen, sometimes from their glutes, spun it down and got the mesenchymal cells from there. We wanted to look at mostly uh, knee pain outcome scores. And within knee arthritis, I know we kind of jumped to arthritis here, but within knee arthritis, there's a couple grading systems. It's called the Keller-Lawrence grading. It goes from one to four. Four is um, pretty much bone on bone you can think of, and two is, is less than that. So when we look at uh, this COOS score here on the right, this is a, a knee outcome score for pain. You can see the pre-treatment or before surgery, and one, or before the injection, sorry. And when you do the injection, it takes about you know, a little bit three to six months to start to seeing uh, significant pain relief. And once we get to that six month mark, it kind of plateaus or continues to increase in, uh, in, in symptoms of pain and quality of life and function. And this is up to uh, two, uh, out to two years. So a lot of times if someone's getting a steroid injection, steroid, you know, has its own avenue as well, but steroids tend to wear off um, you know, two, three, four months. The interesting thing about doing orthobiologics and 
and in, and and for this paper with you know using lipo uh, uh, using lipogens or fat aspirin, uh, we see it kind of carrying out to 24 months. And there's other papers where they go on a little bit longer, three, three, four, five years. And 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 for some of those, you know, the 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 patients quality of life, their pain tend to improve over time as well. Uh, another interesting one, so I was a college baseball player, so I'm interested in this one. The ulnar collateral ligament injury, or uh, what is coined Tommy John surgery for this ligament. Uh, now they are recommending if you have a partial tear within this ligament to try some form of these orthobiologic injections. Usually PRP is one of the easier ones. What they've noticed when, when they do these injections, uh, this will be under ultrasound as well, to, to the ligament here, uh, mean time from injection, or on average, once they get the injection, athletes are now starting to throw at about five weeks or a little bit over a month. And they're returning to play at 12 weeks. So that's about three months from their original injury. And Tommy John surgery sometime, sometimes can take two years to return from. So if you can get someone back in three months versus two years without having a surgery, pretty substantial. So in summary, tying it back to basketball, basketball injuries are a common occurrence more frequently in the lower extremities. Just think about the Google search. Having a neuromuscular warm-up training routine can help reduce the risk of ankle and knee injuries. So you're trying to correct that cue angle or get your hip, knee, and foot in alignment. Uh, over at Swift, Spine Nevada, Tahoe Fracture, we have fellowship trained sports and pain medicine physicians and assistants to assess to treat muscular sports injuries uh, with this conservative care model. If, if, it, if surgery is required, we also can do that as well. And just remember that orthobiologics can be an option to escalate return to playing athletes and improve pain and quality of life in non-athletes. Uh, so I just want to say thank you. This was my, me, you know, basketball back in the day, doing some dunks. Um, just thought I'd throw that out there. I did uh, injure my my wrist playing basketball doing a dunk. So this is uh, bittersweet, but what was that? And it was nice meeting everyone and I'm ready to take any questions if there are any.